Kia ora koutou, everyone. Welcome again um, <laughs> to, to Migration Research um, yeah. Seminar this morning. Um, we're tuning in here from the University of Waikato. Um, yeah, very happy to welcome you along today and to hear Holly Thorpe talk about her research um, around the, the, kind of at the intersections, I guess, of mobilities and, and migration, and obviously sport and human performance as well. Um, uh, Holly's based in the Faculty of Health, Sport and Human Performance. Um, and uh, just looking at her um, bio, has um, published a lot in, in this space, in, including a series of what look like really, really um, important um, books and edited collections, um, and has, is probably also still on a Marsden Fast Start, yes. working on this particular project. Yeah, great, excellent. Um, and so, you know, this is, as I said at the outset, is sort of this connection between migration and mobilities, um, and, and hopefully a, a you know, fascinating conversation for us to have. And, um, present for however long works for you, and then we'll have a conversation after that. Awesome, Any thank you. Any timing at all? Any? Thank you so much. I am so excited to have this group here today to be able to explore some of the themes in my research. And when I saw the invitation come out for this, um, this opening in the New Zealand Migration Research Network, I took it as a good opportunity to put this part of my research at the top of the pile and to get into it. So thank you, and I'm really excited um, to get some feedback from so many people working in and around the space in, in many different ways. So that'll be really productive for me to get that feedback later on because it is, it's still in its early phases of analysis. And um, so hopefully you can bear with me with that a little bit. Let's see if this is gonna work. Is this gonna click forward? There we go, okay. For many researchers and government on aid organisations, children and youth are among the most at risk in contexts of war and natural disaster. Of course, children and youth can be exposed to particularly high levels of physical, social, psychological and political risk in such dangerous, risky conditions. Despite their best intentions, however, there is a tendency for funding agencies, aid workers and researchers sometimes to position children and youth in contexts of war and disaster as victims with little consideration for their agency and ability to develop culturally specific responses to such conditions and events. And in so doing, unique forms of agency, resilience and resourcefulness continue to be overlooked. Thank you. There are a few notable exceptions thus far in the research and one example I'm thinking of here is the work of Henrik Vai, who's written a book called Navigating Terrains of War, Youth and Soldiering in Guinea-Bissau. And that's a, that's a really interesting book um, that I'm seeing some great connections with. Of course, outside of international aid and development studies, there's a growing body of literature that's examining the unique forms of youth politics, activism, entrepreneurialism, and civic engagement emerging in the 21st century. As illustrated in the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, Hong Kong Occupy Central, and the Maple Spring movements, as just some examples, youth are increasingly proficient at utilizing new technologies and social media to forge transnational networks and connections and produce politically inspired groupings and civic performances in ways that were not previously possible. Yet few have considered the creative forms of agency, resilience and civic engagement among local youths in context of war and disaster. And this is where my Marsden Research Fast Art Grant came in. As I was seeing across uh, the various sites of my research that was focusing on informal action sports, that there were quite a few examples of young people in contexts of conflict and disaster or post-disaster that were using these informal sports in really creative ways to improve both their own and others' lives. And so my Mars and Fast Art project was titled Sport in the Red Zone, Youth and Social Change in Spaces of Conflict and Disaster. And I was trying to ask and answer a series of questions here including what are the various forms of social, economic and environmental and physical conditions impacting upon local youth at various stages during and after conflict and disaster? How and why are young people participating in sport and physical activity in sites of war and disaster? Who has access to such physical and political activities and who does not? What are the conditions that enable, facilitate and constrain youth agency? What is the potential of youth engagement in informal sports for improving the health and well-being of individuals and communities in such red zones? What are the practices, politics and strategies being employed by youth to improve their own and others' lives in local contexts? 
and how are youth engaging with transnational networks and social media and their attempts to connect with communities and organizations around the world and to raise awareness and financial support for their grassroots action sports for development type initiatives. And so my Marsden has four case studies. Uh, one is looking at skateboarding in Afghanistan. The other is parkour in Gaza. Uh, the third is looking, or the, the final two there are looking at uh, informal sports and sites of uh, post-disaster. So action sports and post-earthquakes, ongoing earthquakes, Christchurch, and uh, skateboarding in post Katrina in New Orleans. The planned methods were interviews, participant observations, digital ethnography, and media analysis. In reality, my, uh, due to the changing situations in Afghanistan and Gaza, my visits there have not happened. That's been okayed uh, by Marsden. Uh, basically, the university um, made it very difficult to go there because of the high-risk nature and insurance issues there. But it's not a problem, really, because I just changed the methods around when they've been really, really uh, beneficial in different ways. So interviews via Skype in those locations um, and then digital observations and Instagram and Facebook really to track and observe um, how these young people are using social media over time and ongoing media analysis. And here are a couple of the, the types of publications that are coming from that work. Gender has been quite a focus of late, as you can see here. But today I want to be talking about a theme that's emerged from this research that I wasn't really anticipating. And that's probably a mistake on my part that I wasn't anticipating it. But it's how young people are using these action sports and their networks and connections in these locations to facilitate their escape from conflict zones. So this is a theme that's come through from my Afghanistan and my Gaza uh, cases. And it really wasn't a theme across all of my interviews, but it came through from a few of them and it seemed really significant and something uh, deserving of further exploration and uh, explanation. So I followed this theme up with, um, with further interviews. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on this theme that's come from the parkour um, and Gaza case, particularly focusing on two young men. And so I've done interviews with them, um, starting with a project that I did actually with Nita, who's in the room in 2013. And it's been an ongoing project really um, with the Mars and facilitating that. So further interviews in 2016, 2017, and this year and ongoing digital observations throughout that whole time. And then this came through in a couple of the interviews with the young woman from my Afghanistan um, case study. And although there's some really interesting themes across these two, these two locations, Obviously, these, these sites are radically different and there are different issues. Although I'm seeing some interesting themes, today I'm going to be focusing on the parkour and Gaza case, particularly because of the longitudinal nature of it. Um, but as I mentioned, radically different contexts. And so the, the issues around migration are different, despite me seeing some interesting themes in there. Also, a key difference is that the, the Gaza parkour group was a grassroots um, initiative by the young men themselves, whereas the, the skateboarding in Afghanistan is a, an international NGO originally set up by an um, Australian man, uh, Oli Perkovic, who's built this program there. They educate over a, a thousand kids coming through their programs um, in both Kabul and Mazar-e Sharif. But so obviously the issues are unique. And so today I'm going to be focusing on the Gaza context. So looking at how young people are using action sports, in this case parkour for migration and mobilities, there's two key bodies of literature that this project is sitting at the intersection of. One is sport migration and transnational sport mobilities research, and the other is around re uh, refugee and migration, migration research. And I'm just going to briefly um, mention some of the trends in this literature before I get into some of my empirical material. So there's been a significant body of literature on sport migrations, uh, starting with uh, the book, The Global Sports Arena, that, that was published in 1994. And then from there, we've seen this, this, this body of literature growing, some particular sports gaining much more research attention than others. Uh, football, cricket have been some examples. Uh, the, the areas of research has, have evolved over time. Some of that early research was focused much more on sort of the institutional structures that enable or constrain particular types of mobilities. 
and we've been moving in the uh, more recent past towards some of the embodied aspects, gender, race, ethnicity, and this is a quote here from uh, Joseph Maguire, who's been a key scholar in this area. He says, to migrate as part of the global sports process is portrayed as something to celebrate, reflecting an individual's right to move or viewed in unproblematic terms. However, sports migration is bound up in a sports industrial complex that is itself embedded in a series of power struggles that characterize the global sports system. Migration is marked by networks involving athletes, owners, administrators, agents, officials, and media personnel. These interdependencies are multi-layered and incorporate not only economic, but also political, historical, geographic, social, and cultural factors. And a great example of these types of issues came up in the, uh, the latest World Cup, Football World Cup, where the, the winning French team, there was quite a lot of social commentary around what does it mean to be French? What does it mean to be part of, and, and obviously the, the migration, uh, the athlete migration that played a key part in that team success and, and critical issues and discussions around multiculturalism um, came up. And again, some images that sort of signal the, the significance of sports migration at that particular event. One key scholar whose work I am quite inspired by is uh, Thomas uh, Carter, who's really shifted, been actually quite strong critique of some of the sport migration research. And he draws upon a transnational uh, lens to consider the movement of elite professionals, the institutional restraints around such movements, and the means by which such restraints are circumvented, and the impacts transnational movements of sport professionals have upon themselves, their families, the places they leave, and the places where they arrive. He's really focused on how athletes produce their own mobilities. He notes that mobility is not an, an, an inherent personal quality, and rather it's a highly valued commodity whose production is based on the local material conditions where the potential migrant currently is and where he or she intends to arrive. Those local conditions and the relations between them shape migrants' ability to produce their own mobility. He goes on to say that directly impacting migrants' production of their own mobility is their visibility in both localities. Migrant visibility is informed by both by public understandings and awareness for migrants, migrant groups' social identities, which are positioned accordingly within local contexts, and the degree to which the individual in question is visible to relevant authorities, state and sport, whose interests help to shape migrants' movements. In this work, he's really focusing on highly skilled sports migrants, as has most of the work in this area. And in contrast, my work's quite different because these, aren't, these are highly skilled migrants, but they're not part of the same networks and organizations as more traditional organized sports. And so the types of labor that are being performed, the commodities produced, are, are quite different. And this is something I started exploring in my, my recent book, Transnational Mobilities and Action Sport Cultures, which was published in 2014, where I was really focusing on the types of mobilities in action sport cultures, which have quite a distinctive history to more traditional organized sports. Um, and I wasn't just interested in the mobilities of people or just athletes, but also those that travel for recreational purposes, those that work in these industries doing the back-to-back -back winters, for example, or um, working as whether it's ski instructors or working in ski resorts or in the surf industry. That whole idea, the production of this idea of mobility, of traveling for these sports, the bucket lists of go there to surf that break, go there to, to explore and to experience that culture, but also to surf or to climb that, that famous um, rock formation in California, for example. So where has this idea come from? Often from the magazines, the industry, as well as the types of mobilities of people, of objects, of ideas. And so this book uh, tried to get to that. And in so doing, started recognizing the importance of immobilities. And this, is, this definitely informs this talk today. The second key body of literature is around uh, refugee and migration research. And I really, I'm really excited by some of the um, interdisciplinarity in this space, um, particularly those scholars who are working around issues of power. Uh, Sarah Ahmed's work, thinking about 
what different effect does it have on identity when one is forced to move? Does one ever move freely? What movements are possible? And moreover, what movements are impossible? Who has a passport and can move there? Who does not have a passport and yet moves? And so I'm excited by the, the scholarship in this area dealing with issues of power, borders, and the state in terms of enabling or constraining particular movements of individuals and groups in particular uh, socio-cultural, political, economic contexts. And I'm actually really excited by the work and the shift that's been more recent towards embodied, sensual, affective, lived experience of migration and displacement. Which I'm sure many, many in this uh, virtual room are aware of. And for my project, this, this book here really spoke qu um, quite loudly to me in terms of some of the themes that I've been exploring. Uh, particularly struggles with home, deals with the ways in which power informs notions of home and belonging, and with important issues of power that necessarily permeate process of, processes of movement and violence. And there are four key themes in this book, uh, particularly um, so these are identified in the afterward um, by Steputat, which I really enjoyed his uh, writings on this. And he says, these four key themes are the relationship between politics and personal experiences of fragility and loss of home, the place of movement and violence in relation to state and other forms of authority and regimes of regulation, the third is confinement as a particular form of displacement. And the fourth there is the experience of loss of home as simultaneously destructive and potentially liberating. And it's that, that fourth point, I think, is a real theme that comes through from my uh, material I'll share today. He goes on to say that this book explicitly addresses the problems and effects of confinement in a world where mobility is often celebrated as an indicator of progress. And he raises the question of how to deal conceptually with the issue of confinement and conflict, or more generally of the violence in place that displaces rights, entitlements, and livelihood practices for confined populations. And he says, apart from being subjects and objects of cultures of violence, people lose their access to land, markets, education facilities, labor migration, sacred places, et cetera, et cetera. And combined with the fact that transported goods become scarce and expensive, such confinements result in severe impoverishment of a majority of the population. There's some really relevant uh, themes in that book and across the literature for my talk today. But I'm gonna be working more, or at the intersection, as Francis noted before, um, across the migration and mobilities research. And obviously, um, I see the work in the mobilities um, paradigm or sociology of mobilities as, as um, quite exciting to work through because it's not just focusing on the movements but also the imagined movements, the virtual movements, the, the constrained movement, movements. And as um, Monica Boucher says here, it's, it's an exploring the potential movement and blocked movement as well as voluntary temporary immobilities, practices of dwelling and nomad, nomadic place, placemaking. And they're all viewed as constitutive of economic, social and political relations. And working with John Uri, they identify at least five interrelated mobilities producing social life organized across distance, corporeal travel, so actually the movement of people for work, leisure, family life, pleasure, migration and escape, as well as the movement of objects, imaginative travel, virtual travel and communicative travel. And each of these um, are themes that have come through in my research on, on parkour and how young people from Gaza have been using that. And there's some really interesting work happening in this space across mobilities and migration. These are just some of the many examples that are out there. So how does this project that I'm sharing with you today, or this, this uh, paper, how does it build upon and extend this literature, or these two bodies of literature? One, it's going to explore the mobilities and immobilities, constrained, imagined, physical, digital, across the migration experience, so before, during, and post-migration. A lot of the research focuses on, on after, often the settlement or resettlement processes, and actually because of the long-term nature of my, my ongoing research with the, these young men from, from Gaza, I've got that whole perspective, and I've got their voices and experiences throughout that migration experience. I'm also trying to recognize the, their agency and creativity throughout this process, but always, of course, within, within the structures of state and government at both ends and various sites along their journeys. 
And I think my data really reveals that some, and it is a select few refugee or migrant youth, um, they're not necessarily the victims that they're often portrayed to be. Some are highly creative, strategic, and very entrepreneurial in their efforts to enable and facilitate more mobile lives. So the first, the first phase, the, the production of future mobilities, and this, this theme here is, is their perspectives from Gaza. And I'm gonna be talking about um, how they perceive and experience um, uh, living in a conflict zone, how they use these action sports for hope and resilience, the importance of social media for visibility and building hopefully potential future mobilities, and obviously their imagined and constrained mobilities. And I found this, uh, this book here to be quite useful um, in terms of identifying some of the master narratives infused, or the Palestinian master narratives, um, one being loss and land dispossession, the theme of resistance, and the third around uh, existential insecurity of Palestinian ident identity and the insecurity of everyday life in Palestine. And I don't think... Um, we can go too far from this topic without considering the significant work of Edward Said. And he, he definitely identifies and explores and critically um, unravels those, some of those key themes. He says the Muslim and Christian Palestinians who lived in Palestine for hundreds of years until they were driven out in 1948 were un unhappy victims of the same movement whose whole aim had been to end the victimization of Jews by Christian Europe. Yet it is, precise, it is precisely because Zionism has, was so admirably successful in bringing Jews to Palestine and constructing a nation for them that the world has not been concerned with what the enterprise meant in loss, dispersion, and catastrophe for the Palestinian natives. And I'm not going to, I don't have time to um, go through a detailed history of um, Israel Palestinian politics, but obviously, um, Significant, significant forms of, um, of isolation, occupation, um, the, the lives of young people and people in general in Palestine and particularly Gaza. Um, they've, they've had serious, so many forms of conflict over the years, but the, uh, the many ways their lives are constrained. Um, and I think we've seen a significant example of this early this year. As of August 13th, there are 168 Palestinians killed um, and almost uh, 1,700, 200, 1,700 injured. Um, 3,000 of those were children. So this is ongoing, ongoing protest for very, very legitimate uh, reasons. And a brief but sufficient description of the differences between Palestine life in the West Bank or East Jerusalem and Palestinian life in Gaza is that all things, culture, hardship and politicisation, devotion, etc., seem more intense in Gaza, according to Barber. Gaza goes on to say that Gaza has been isolated for so long that very little is known about it, even by Palestinians from the West Bank or Jerusalem. Since the early days of the, of the Intifada, Palestinians have generally not been permitted to enter or leave Gaza. Community, uh, missing something there. As for the broader world community, virtually all that is known or remembered about Gaza is footage of conflict. And Baba goes on to say that Palestinian children and youth in Gaza, every facet of their lives is informed and shaped by political history and current political dynamics and realities of which they are very aware. And this really uh, became became very, very clear right from the early interviews and work with these young men in Gaza. Politics was part of everything they said. According to participant A, um, I just, so, should just say that ethically, uh, my participants are aware that because of their, their use of social media, that they know, they know that they, are, they publicly talk about these issues a lot, um, but I am trying to protect their identities as much as possible. So participant A, is that Hamas, they don't have this experience to be the head of the government. I'm not saying that they aren't Palestinian, but it's not right to stay like this because actually they don't care for the people of, in Gaza. Because the people in Gaza, they're full of problems. There is no electricity, there is no water. The Israeli people, they closed the border about three years ago. They didn't open the border. Participant B, there's no work in Gaza. You can't find work. 
Before two years, there was war in Gaza. We don't know when there is, where there is war. We don't know the situation about work because we are under occupation and we don't know when we will be unsafe. All the people here in Gaza, after they finish university, they can't find work. They go to university knowing there is no work after. No one finds work in Gaza. There's a continual tension, a feeling of tension that at any time a war could start. Occupation makes everything hard for us. because so when we want to go out of Gaza, the borders are closed. You are always under attack, always. There was a bomb last night. We were under attack for some minutes. When you want to do something, the occupation makes it very, a very hard situation. And these ideas of constrained spatial, physical, and imagined mobilities really came through really clearly in my interviews with participants. And Kelly writes, for many Palestinians, the ad hoc interventions of the region states have meant that their presence in any place is always contingent, yet they also face severe restrictions on moving elsewhere. This has produced a situation where displacement and return, absence and presence, movement and confinement are intertwined with one another. And one of my participants said to me, the bad thing is the occupation. The Israeli occupation is the bad thing because they always make a war. They always try to make us in one room. It's like one room in Gaza and we can't go out of this room. So that real sense of, of, of um, constrained mobilities is, is really significant for these young men. And this speaks to that theme uh, by Steputat, who said, you, uh, not, he was not referring to youth in Gaza, but experiencing struggles from spatial mobility. And this is very much um, influencing how these young men could imagine their futures. I think this quote says it pretty well. It's just the freedom. The freedom is the only thing that we miss in Gaza, even if we had some bombs. But if we didn't have this closed borders, we would not be in such problems. We would think about the future, about working, because if we had open borders, stuff can get into Gaza, so like people can start work, start their life. And interestingly, and this is a theme that came through um, in the Afghanistan project as well, this desire for freedom and this hope or desperation for mobilities has been particularly accentuated by, by, um, by youths in Gaza and Afghanistan too, by their engagement with social media. Because they're seeing this world of, of mobilities, it makes it particularly hard when they're constrained. And so participant B said to me, I'm always watching and thinking, and he means watching via social media. Oh, I want to be like this, traveling and doing parkour in all of those places. And many of these participants, uh, we have been using parkour symbolically and psychologically to help them overcome some of this, the sense of frustration, some of the obstacles in their lives. So one of my participants said, Gaza, it's full of obstacles, it's full of life problems, it's full of siege. We use the idea of parkour to escape from our situation, to overcome the hard life, to overcome the obstacles and the borders and all of this. And this has been supported, um, this is a, a Gazan psychologist who said, many young people in Gaza are angry because they have very few opportunities and are locked in. And art and sports forms such as free running gives them an important method to express their desire for freedom and it allows them to overcome the barriers that society and politics have imposed on them. It literally sets them free. And this is a theme that we, uh, Nita and I explored in our early work uh, looking at this, young, this group of young men in Gaza. Another thing that's come through in, in this series of interviews uh, was how they're using social media for visibility. And if we go back to that, um, some of Carter's work where he says, transnational sports migrants must produce a visible self to enact a mobile self. And for these young participants, they talk, these talk, they talk about the importance of social media. They say social media is everything for us. Social media can make us with the, with the people out of Gaza. We can show our skills via the internet because we don't have another way because we are in Gaza and there's occupation. We can't travel at any time. We can't go out at any time. We can't be in a competition at any time. This is the best way for us to show our skills. Just on the internet, we don't have another way because we can't go out. And it's a particular type of visibility. And this is what I started um, really ex realizing I probably this year actually is they were very strategic and political in this type of visibility. Um, and trying to show the most dangerous moves they could. And that helped gain visibility. It helped share and get more followers. 
and one of the participants said, you know the risk in park or in our style, we make, da we make dangerous movements. That's what makes us more famous. And so many people around the world, they know about us because of our crazy tricks. And this type of visibility of high risk and also, um, as I'll say in a minute, um, quite a political type of visibility helped them make these connections with the transnational park or community. And this participant, participant mentioned, um, we have a lot of friends out of Gaza. We have relationships with Italy Parkour, Parkour France, American Parkour, with all the teams, all the parkour teams around the world, they know about PK Gaza, they know about our team, and they're attributing that very much to their, their social media um, strategies. But the way they're using social media is also political. They make sure that they, when they were in Gaza, they were trying to always be in front of broken buildings um, to, to really say something to the world about what life in, in Gaza is for these young men. One of them said to me, we contribute very significantly to raising international awareness of what is happening in, in Gaza. We offer video clips, photographs, and writings related to the situation in which we live in the Gaza Strip and deliver the message to all the peoples that's watching online that there are oppressed people here. And these imagined and constrained mobilities really, really were a key theme in this. So that at this point they were living in Gaza and saying, if I'm out of Gaza, I will not be like I am in Gaza. Out of Gaza, parkour is a sport. The pe people that are responsible about the sport, they pay to the people that are doing it well. I mean, that if, if I'm out of Gaza, I will get interest from the people that are responsible about our sport because you're doing something for the country. So this idea that when they get out, they'll get recognition, they'll get opportunities for, for being a skilled parkour athlete. I got many invitations to join competitions, competitions from around the world. I've been trying for more than three years to get a visa, and then I can't travel because of the crossings, or I get refused from the embassies, but I just keep trying and will never give up. One day it will come. I will not stop because I want to join a par these parkour events. I know that my future is just in parkour, so I will do my best and try again and again and again many times. So they were actually getting visas to go to these international events, and then they'd get to the border and the border would be closed. More than six people from the team, they get a visa. They're waiting so much to get it out from the rougher border but there is no rougher border. We don't have a border with Egypt because it's totally closed. They don't open it. They get the visa, they get the okay from the consulate, China, Italy, Germany, many different places, they've got the visa and they're just waiting until the border opens. The visa finishes and they don't get out. Our border with Egypt, you can say it's 99% closed. There is no border. Participant B told me, it's hard because everything we have to do is for ourselves. In Gaza, no one looks for us and no one helps us for our sport. We are in a hard situation for sure, but we will not stop. We will pay for ourselves until we get what we want. We will try all the time and we will do it ourselves. We are a team, training, filming and planning together. We've spent many years without support, so it's normal for us. We will continue even if there is no interest. And this really speaks to some of the work by Chatty, who says that given the appalling poverty of many refugee lives, the prolonged low and high level intensity armed conflict and the structure of violence in the home and schools and in daily encounters with occupation forces, as well as Palestinian security, it is remarkable that Palestinian youth continue to maintain a sense of agency against all odds and hold on to aspirations for a better personal and community future. And I truly saw this in my interviews with these young men. They really had a sense of hope, and, um, and really taking a very agentic um, approach to, to trying to improve their own lives and, and those of young people in their communities. So now into phase two, departure and arrivals. And I wanna share two tales of migration because they're both uh, distinct. Just been A, and these are his own words. In April, 2012, we went to Italy. It was a project we went to maybe five cities and we met so many people. Then when we came back to Gaza, it was very, very difficult to live here. I was saying, what is that hell we live in? We go there, wow, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, everything's very beautiful. 
then we come back and everything becomes more bad. The electricity, nothing to do, just waiting for something. You will never get it because you just dream there and you plan, but nothing will happen. Siege, blockade, suffering, war, all of this. So I say it's enough. I promise myself if we get another chance to go to Europe, we will not come back here. We have to go there and see this world, see this life and try this experience here in Europe. Do all of what we would like to do. What we planned. And in 2013, we get the second chance. And it was also a project for the sport organization in Italy. We go around 25 people. I remember the people who came back to Gaza. It was around six or seven people. The rest of these people, they escape. They, the organization said to us, you'll have to stay with us and come back to Gaza with us because we put our signature on a paper with the Italian consulate. If someone escapes, we have to pay for them. But we don't care about it. I just see my future over there and I say, I'm going to go and get it. I don't care what will happen if they pay. And then he goes on in quite an emotional way and says, it was a shame. It was crazy and very stupid. It was the most stupid decision I make in my life to leave everything and go to something. I don't know what it is, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to be, what I'm going to have. He told me, I just go with his friend. We start to go around the streets and we don't have enough money to go anywhere. I have to go ahead and just to follow my dreams because in Gaza, Sorry, Every, everything was very, very difficult and we started to feel lonely. Just like a little boy, I wanted to come back and have my mother, but I have to help myself. I was 24 years old. I still need to stay there, but I just say, I have to go ahead and just to follow my dreams because in Gaza, all the people say that Europe, it's your dream. If you want to dream, dream in Europe because everything there is possible. You can do everything. Go there and dream and do everything. So that was my plan. And every, everything I have done here without planning until now. They say to us, that's the reason they stop all of the trips to Italy. But I don't think so, because this is a normal thing. Anybody who can escape from Gaza, he will never come back, I swear. Because if you come here to Europe and see this life, you would like to live this life. You would like to change your life. We were thinking about ourselves, and we don't care about anything. And it was a mistake. It was wrong for us. We just leave, and we just escape. But the problem, I think it's not me and his friend of name's friend. We just did something normal. Anybody in our place would do this. All the people in Gaza, all the young people, they wish one day to escape from there because nobody can live like in that situation. It is hell there. If anybody gets a chance, they will not come back. It's natural. And what I think is really interesting in this, in this quote, he's not, acknowledged, he's not taking that individual blame. He's saying this is a bigger structural issue and we're just part of a much bigger picture. Participant B, he traveled a few years later actually last year. He said, after three years of trying, in the end, I got a visa. After I was invited for a parkour competition here in Sweden, I got an athlete's visa sponsored by a parkour organization in Sweden. I also got some help from friends in Sweden who helped me make more information, like personal invitations to make it stronger to get a visa. So I got that after two weeks from applying for a visa. And the time that I got the visa, the crossing between us and Egypt opened the day after. So I was just really, really lucky. And so you can see here in this quote that it was these connections um, that were made initially from the social media, that they became well known and they started making those connections so that there were people, friends in Sweden who are helping him put in his application. So he gets across the border, um, says goodbye to his father, his family. He feels very, very lucky to, that the border opened on this particular day. But there was a problem, that my name was not on the list of the people who will travel. So I went down to the people who work in the Sport Federation in Gaza, like the Olympic Committee there, and they helped me. They put my name on the list and I went to Egypt. But my visa was not valid yet. So when I went to Egypt, they put me in a room until my visa started working. So for one week, I stayed in a room in the airport. This happens to so many people and they treat us, treat us very bad. They, they took all our stuff, all of our technologies and stuff like my phone. They don't let us connect our fa contact our families. And then finally, I traveled to Copenhagen. So once he finally makes it across that border, he's staying in a room in the airport in Egypt, not knowing when he'll be allowed to travel. And interestingly, um, because his journey happened sometime after um, participant A, he was he, and he's a very proactive user of social media. He was documenting 
documenting his travels. And um, what we see in some of these images is the really um, affective experience upon arrival, the joy of connecting with his, his friends from Gaza, um, the joys of finally meeting some of these people who he'd been watching for so long, connecting with via the internet, and, and these pleasures of experiencing new environments, doing parkour in the rain, for example. You know, I'm just, I'm used to watching these people on the internet. I never met them in real life, even when I know them. So when I went there and I met so many, many of the people that I knew before that I was watching and who, that, who were inspiring me. But these people knew me also because our team was very much in social media in Gaza. So they're all welcoming. They were happy to meet me. And that made me happy also that I met them. It was, really was a very nice feeling. I didn't really care about the competition. I always wanted to meet the people, the people who were doing the same sport. It changed my life, certainly. From Gaza in one day, everything changed with parkour athletes and a parkour gym and a parkour competition doing what I like. Something that he'd been hoping, dreaming of for so long. Then from that competition, I decided to stay. I said that I don't want to go through that again. More than three years of trying. And I actually knew that I can't go back to Gaza because the crossing is closed. After I left it closed. So if I go, I have to be stuck in Egypt until they open the crossing again. There's constantly constrained mobilities are very, very um, significant to the, the ways these young men are imagining their lives. The third theme now on settlement. And this theme of how they were using their action sports networks, resources and connections. I think we've already seen that in the um, previous comments, but this was really, really important when they, when they arrived. Um, I'm doing well. Because after I came to Sweden, I decided to make parkour workshops. And now I'm giving parkour courses for kids. I get paid for that by an organization who's also working in parkour. I joined them as a member of their team because they knew that I'm here. So they make me a main part of their team. So many people are interested in what I'm doing. I have so many friends who are doing parkour and trying to help me. I'm getting support from organizations as well, such as a water, a water company who sponsored him. And again, still, that the, the strategies for visibility using social media are, are really, really important. Social media, without it, we are nothing. For example, the sponsors want us to work in social media and put their names out there. Also, we usually get some people who want to film with us for advertisements or something. So they see our videos and say, oh, these are the right people that I want to work with. It's important. Without it, we would be unknown. Then we will ha uh, have no work here. I get every day more followers and I want to do something to get more. Maybe start more making parkour education videos for people in the Arabian countries because they are asking for us to do that all the time. On YouTube, we have more than 100,000 views just for teaching parkour on the internet. So the, the digital and entrepreneurialism happening upon migration after arriving is really important for getting work and for build, continuing to build those connections. We want to share what we are doing. At the same time, we want to get more followers. When you get more followers, that helps you get sponsors and to get more jobs. So if we compare it back to the, the, the athletes of Thomas Carter's work, um, the type of work these young men are doing is quite different, right? They're not going and playing a, um, a competition for a team uh, within an organization. They are very much creating their own work. Uh, and this digital entrepreneurialism is, part, is an important part of that. This is a, um, a Red Bull video that was um, filmed about these two young men and their journeys from Gaza to Europe. And as you can imagine, we know from the literature, there are many challenges uh, for settlement. One of these was language, uh, finding places to stay, and that real sense of having to do everything by themselves. trying to move a little bit faster here. I know we've got limited time. But the impermanence of visas created this, despite achieving everything they thought they would achieve, still there's a sense of impermanence. So I came in on an athlete visa and I could stay for one month, then I applied for a four month visa and got that, then another. There was a residency for people who came from Gaza and they were waiting. How is the situation going to be? They just want us to wait until the situation changes. But I told them, when is the situation going to change? What, you want, want us to wait for 100 years? But without having the long visa, it, it can really constrains um, how, how far into the future they can imagine and, and also affects 
their their strategies um, for what they're doing in terms of making these new places home. So I've got a residency visa for, for work and study. I got that because the situation in Gaza hasn't changed yet, so they gave it to me. And then I have to renew it all the time. But I don't have the long permit, so I can't study. I can't do anything, really. Like, I will always think about the permit, that maybe they're going to send me back. Why will I learn their language if it's like that? They don't accept the long permit. And still, they're using parkour to help them with the stresses of migration and settlement. And actually, there's a, a, quite a growing body of literature that's exploring, and actually policymakers and practitioners that are exploring and increasingly drawing upon sport as a vehicle to assist with the resettlement of young people from refugee backgrounds. And I'm not saying that some of that type of work is um, problematic, but how these young men um, were, were using their parkour to help make connections, get a sense of social um, belonging, creating jobs for themselves, um, so there is some interesting parallels with some of that work. So upon settlement, uh, or upon arrival, and starting their new lives in Europe, they talked about seeing things differently. When we come to Europe, it was a different life. We started to see new things, and our minds started to change. Because when we were in Gaza, it was very difficult for us to understand the people, understand um, the, um, I can't see that there, understand the ways people, the other world, the life there and all of this. When we came here, our minds have become more understanding for that life. We start to care about the life and we start to see the meaning of a real life in Europe. And enabled a chance to think about the future, to plan for the future. I want to build my future. I'm young. If I stayed there, I would just spend my whole life doing nothing. It's hard here, but I can help myself. Nothing comes from nothing. Everything will happen. Well, I can't see because of those image boxes. <laughs> Something I'm sure you guys can see on the other end, have to work hard for. So they, they, they recognize these challenges and the difficulty of it, but they're willing to, to work hard and to, to make it work in this new context. But for them staying connected with home, family and friends and the politics at home are, are really, really important. It's really hard for my mum. She cried for three days when I left. But my family are proud of me. All the time I'm happy that they're proud of me. I use Messenger, anything. We talk together always. Usually I talk to them every day. I always want to contact. I always want contact to feel that I'm with them, to feel that I'm beside them. For sure we will be again together. Uh, we will be again. But when, that's the thing. And also, they mentioned when there, when there is conflict going on, that's, that's really, really emotionally challenging for them when they're away. So the, the importance of social media to stay connected, um, but all the worries and the anxiety that's caused when they're away from that. And I love this quote here. I'm, I'm following also politics pages to read what's happening in my country. I don't want to be here and just forget my country. I want to feel their feeling, to feel their life, to know that they feel and know how they feel because I was part of that. So social media, these new technologies are playing a really important part in helping stay connected while away. And that they're, they're using social media to, to, to express these feelings. So talking about missing home, missing family, the struggles of, of being away. But there's always this longing for home and this hope for return. I want to live a little bit for my age, but I will never forget my people, my life there, and one day I'm going to go back to Gaza. I'm going to live there because all of the people, the Palestinian people, they're supposed to come back to Gaza, to Palestine, and live there. Because if we leave our country, who will defend it? Because Palestine and the situation there needs someone to care, someone to defend it. It's not important to defend like a military or something. We, are, we have different ways to defend our land. But actually, maybe you will not believe me. But believe me, I swear, I feel my life here in Sweden and in Europe, you can say it's a kind of hell. I have so many problems because I miss to, come, miss to come to Gaza and take a shower with the sand from our ground. I miss that so much. Each new day I'm thinking about when I can go back to Gaza, when I can live there again. 
when I can be beside my friends, beside my family, beside my people, because it's my life. It's my real life to live in the middle of the situation, the middle of my people. It's my real life there. And for me, this quote really connects with some of Gomez's work that highlights the importance of remembering and nostalgia for refugee and displaced settlers and how those memories are often very embodied forms of knowledge, evoking the voices, smells, signs, tastes and desires. This nostalgic imagery is coming through there in terms of the wanting to take a shower with the sand from our ground. But there's a real paradox of these new mobilities. So while they get to travel around Europe, go to these parkour events and competitions, um, participant B told me, but I still feel that I'm not free because I can't go to my country. So there's real paradoxes. Yes, you can move in one sense, but you can't go home. So confinement and displaced livelihoods are very much a reality for youth living in conflict-torn ter uh, torn territories like Gaza, but also for those who have made it out, where their highly vulnerable temporary status severely confines their ability to move around freely. So drawing upon a mobilities approach encourages me to ask, how are youth's experience of migration, home, belonging, estrangement, affected when their residency is always temporary, fragile and vulnerable? How are migrant youth's experience of home, place, space affected when the border is closed behind them and will they know that if they return, they will unlikely leave again? How do spatial immobilities, corporeal mobilities, imagined and virtual mobilities intersect in youth's experience of immigration from conflict zones? If we go back to Hammock's uh, earlier work with those key uh, themes of loss and land dispossession, resistance and existential insecurity, as those uh, he identifies as three key themes in Palestinian master narrative, and particularly this idea of resistance. He says that resistance, through resistance, despair turns to possibility, fatalism to optimism, vulnerability to agency. Resistance confers power, and with that power, the redemption from suffer suffering, oppression and victimization. Resistance provides the inherent struggle in Palestinian daily existence with a sense of meaning, and purpose. So for Gazan youth who have only ever known loss and land dispossession, resistance and existential insecurity, how does this influence their migration processes in terms of making meaning in a society where resistance is no longer part of daily life? And this quote here really speaks to that. Here everything is very easy. Everything is very silly. There is no meaning. I can't see a meaning for this life. Anything I want to do, I can do it very easily. This is not special for me to get everything very easily. It's not my way of life. I want to feel like before. Everything was very hard. I was dreaming and planning. I was doing everything. But here I don't have a dream because everything is possible. Everything is very easy, very silly. I wish one day and as soon as I come back there, I live with my people in my real life. I'm going to do it one day. I wish that will be soon. So I think this speaks to um, some of those themes. When those, those themes, are so, those narratives are so embodied in everything you think of, of who you are and what meaning is, what happens in, in the migration experience. So the feelings of sorrow over lost relationships and irrever irreversible displacements on one side and of the expectations related to, a new, to new horizons, opportunities and challenges on the other are too often set up as being at odds with each other. Rather than either or, we should think of the amb ambiguous and contradictory experience of loss and liberation as often coexisting in the difficult and tormenting process of adjustment to the loss of home. I think this quote here from Steputat really speaks to the themes in my research where there's, there is this liberation, there are these new opportunities, there are imagined new futures at the same time, such loss and these constrained mobilities. There's always this longing for, for home. So the problem, however, according to Steputat, is that the fact that so many people do not experience any new sense of possibility, but rather new varieties of confinement, dispossession and displacement, this is the problem of migration from places of, of violence. The sense of possibility is not something people just have, but rather the quest for achieving this sense is something they live by. And I've definitely seen that in these participants. The sense of possibility is something that they live by. I just want to finish um, by Note, you, I'm sure many of you have noted that I have not used the word refugee to refer to these young men, and this is, this is purposeful. Uh, we know that the refugee label is complex and powerful, but these young men themselves did not 
ever refer to themselves as refugees. Their migration to Europe was, was escaping the conflict and poverty in Gaza, but it was not forced migration. They do not seek the leg, they do not meet their legal criteria for asylum seekers. Instead, these young men are highly skilled athletes and the physical and digital labor and commodities that they're producing are very different to athletes in more traditional societies or sports, sorry, but they are nonetheless highly skilled migrants and the networks and connections they're tapping into are different from elite athlete migrants in competitive sports. So adopting a mobilities framework here, this project aims to further problematize the refugee label by revealing the agency and highly creative approaches being developed by a select few youth living in conflict zones and across the migration experience pre, during, post, while also recognizing the structural and state constraints on their sense of possibility at various points along their journeys. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Holly, um, for a really fascinating, yes. in-depth um, conversation. Um, could we uh, see if there? I don't know. We're we're, we're running up to twelve o'clock, so if anyone has to go, I understand. But uh, can we see if we've got some questions for the conversation? Maybe outside white couple to start with. <laughs> Anyone? I, I will, um, in, in the absence of questions coming initially, I'll ask a, a few. I, the, the question that sort of kept um, sticking for me, I was wondering what, are the, what is the basis of mobility in a, in, a, in a financial sense for these individuals? So you've talked a lot about access to visas, which mm. is gonna cost a lot, no doubt, in many yeah. of these instances. Mm. Travel obviously costs. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, in the cases of the short-term visits abroad initially, that mm. would cost as well, mm. possibly even longer. So it seems mm. like there's a lot of um, a lot of yeah, financing needed yeah. here. Is that something that these young people already have access to? Do they access through the networks that you're talking about? How, how, does, how does financing play into That's a process? really good question. Someone's paying for their travel, um, and I'm not actually sure who that is. I'm pretty sure it's mostly not them, but I know that um, when they were getting the athlete visa to go to competitions, that is typically paid for by the organization that's bringing them over um, but as we saw in participant a once he decided not to go back there was no money and they were on the street and there was severe poverty um, and then it was okay I've got to take care of myself here and then again they filmed a lot of advertisements um, one of them actually both of them got into to running workshops with kids going to schools connect making those connections and then they're with those types of jobs, that's paid work. Mm -hmm. um, but but your point is does highlight that difference between athletes, skilled athletes, and more traditional sports, where the organisation structures are there. So they get the visa, they go there. There's probably housing, um, you know, uh, they're available for them. They've given a weekly salary mm -hmm. for this long length of their contract. Whereas these young men go there and they've got to create their own jobs and they're using those networks and resources and connections in this transnational park or community to do that. But there's no security of it. Like there would be not in the security for an athlete is always, um, you know, limited in terms of they're not performing, they're going home basically, but the structures are very different. And part of that is the, there's insecurity around the financial. Mm -hmm. Mm. What are the organisations? What are their rationales around supporting these athletes? Is it about um, is it a, is it about encouraging a global parkour community mm. and supporting that? Is it is it claims to human rights? Is mm. it around politics? Is it a mix of all of those things? I mean, yeah. especially if they're start, they're putting money into mm. this and they're making claims to sponsoring people. Yeah, I think in those early um, relationships with uh, some of the Italian organisations, their part of it was the human rights aspect, and they were. Um, part of the sort of tour was about raising awareness about issues in, in, in Palestine and Gaza. So there was, there was that aspect to it. Um, but obviously that, that relationship um, got very problematic when the athletes didn't go back. Um, but mostly these, these guys are amazingly skilled athletes. And um, so yes, part of their narrative and part of their, um, part of it is that political aspect. But at the end of the day, they're incredibly skilled 
athletes doing amazing stuff and people want to be part of that and they want to be involved. So I think the, the politics is always there for them though. Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, mm. yeah, I don't, I don't, I probably would need to talk to those organizations to understand their motives for bringing these athletes over. Mm. Oh, Martha. Martha. You might have to unmute. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Holly. That was fantastic and so much to think through. I know, my brain is. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, I wondered, uh, uh, um, Vincent Kaufman's work in the sociology of mobilities has highlighted the ways that moving um, physical movement actually enables the movement between social locations. Mm. And so I thought that um, I would be really interested in how they might define their socioeconomic circumstances despite the temporariness and living in poverty. Mm. And the things that I thought was quite interesting is not that they slotted into work with advertisers or sponsors, but that um, they, they haven't slotted into political speaking or being sponsored by other agencies, you know, that you've mentioned so far. But that would be quite interesting because clearly the photos are quite politicized, you know, on their social media. But um, if, you know, are they, how do they integrate that kind of political voice um, when they're in person in a place, you know, or do they just do it online, which is fine. I just was interested in, and does that um, sense that they are improving their social location, which is just more of a social mobilities, uh, I guess, approach, social mobility, you know, come through it all. Thanks, Martha. That's, um, that question has so many aspects to it. And one of the, did, did come through from my interviews with these young men, in living in Europe, they do often come across uh, conversations with people who assume a particular thing about Gaza or have very stereotypical views about Palestine. And they use those opportunities to, to correct them or to say, this is what life is there for us. And, and often say, it's not as bad as you might see on the on the news, there's lots of different things going on there. So often they're using those everyday interactions to sort of challenge people's stereotypical or kind of limited understandings. So they do talk about in the everyday trying to to to, um, to change perspectives of the lived lives of, of people in Gaza. Um, the it did come through challenges. The politics is part of it always for them. And that sometimes helps and it sometimes hinders. So when they were in Gaza, they had opportunities for, for um, sponsorship deals. And this was kind of hard to articulate because we always had a language thing. And sometimes English was, we were trying to, and particularly the interviews in, that were done when they were in Gaza, you know, this often would be breaking out, the, the, the electricity would go out, um, there'd be a lot of background noise. So sometimes it was hard to really get to what they were saying and I had to go back quite a few times. But there was comment that um, there were sponsorship offers when they were in Gaza, but the, the sponsors wouldn't allow them to have their name, PK Gaza. And for them that was unacceptable because part of what they were doing was about raising awareness, but for the sponsors that was too political. So they actually said no to those types of opportunities. So in some elements, um, yeah, sometimes that political helped and sometimes it didn't. And they took the high road in some of those instances, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, social mobility in terms of um, financial well-being it never came through. It, it wasn't a theme. They weren't trying to make a lot of money. They were just trying to create a sense of future for themselves. They were coaching. They weren't going, they weren't trying to make a lot of money. They were just trying to get a sense of stability and a sense of future. So yeah, that really wasn't a theme and that's maybe why it hasn't come out so much, but it's an interesting one to think through. So thanks both Francis and Martha for, for yeah, redirecting me in that direction as well. I have a question. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, thank you, Holly. That was uh, really interesting and so much rich material there to work through, I guess. Um, I was sort of wondering um, how these parkour athletes related to their fellow <laughs> parkour athletes in other countries, because it strikes me that the way they use it in Gaza, it's 
partly it's creating a kind of normality, I suppose, and it's, it's a sport, but it's also a political yeah. act of resistance that perhaps falls away once they settle somewhere else. And I imagine other parkour athletes, you know, that element isn't in there. So it's a, um, that comment about life and real life in Europe and it being maybe perhaps a bit meaningless because you don't have to resist. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And I kind of tried to get to that because I saw some differences in their social media. Uh, when they were in Europe, the backgrounds were so less evocative and interesting it's just you know by a stream or at a school or didn't have the broken buildings etc that they use to, to create the sense of um, a particular type of visibility in the transnational parkour community and what I saw on social media is they often are pulling in images from previously when they were in Gaza to reiterate their connections with that um, mm. because that is a point of distinction it's really important that they by living in Europe because, um, but their relationship with the, the more transnational park or community is, um, I think they do try to remind people of where they've come from because that's a point of distinction too. Um, and the ways they do that via social media or the t-shirts they wear. And, and one of my participants talked about how excited he was when there was a filming crew that went to Gaza and was able to bring him one of the PK Gaza hoodies, sweatshirt, back to him, and how wearing that helped him stay connected and also a type of visibility of where he's come from. But also it shows the constraints on, on objects as well, and objects of meaning. Um, so yeah, the ways they navigate their, their connections with Gaza in Europe is interesting and it happens both in, in the corporeal moving body but also in their digital representations of, of who they are and where they've come from. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Isn't it crazy though, in interviews with two men over various points in time, how much material there is, how much, and that's what I've really been struggling with from a, from an, you know, uh, a qualitative researcher perspective when we're working in these, in these topics around migration and, and how much there really is within one person's story. Um, and then you have two, and I'm, I'm weeks and weeks deep into analysis and still here I am, a big mess, basically. <laughs> So yeah, it's, um, it's amazing. The richness of these stories when we try to capture it, and particularly over time, which I think has been the value of this project. But it's also the ways in which they change. Mm. I think that's what's fascinating here, like mm. in terms of the key, key things that you're interested in there around imagining mm. futures in mm. different kinds of contexts, those shift. In fact, one of the participants explicitly said as much, and they said they can't imagine, you know, you know that, or maybe it was your interpretation of it, mm. but couldn't imagine a future once in Europe because mm. it, it, or the imagining of future was quite different because anything was possible. That's you right. Didn't yeah, dream yeah. Anymore. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so it's not only that, that you've got such richness in the stories which you have, but that also that the the the, the emotions, the the question of, of hope that you signaled mm. earlier, the the imagining of future actually shifts quite a lot in terms of where people are at geographically, but also temporally in terms of their mm. own relationship with Paco and mm. the like. So I, that I found very fascinating. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, kia ora, Holly. Thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, I really love um, the idea that parkour uh, has that liberating potential in the way it changes people's minds from seeing obstacles to, yeah. you know, they, they become uh, things that they can jump off and leap off and it's kind of sort of twists your mind a bit. Uh, and for me, that connects very much with the... Um, the definition of normalization that's at the heart of uh, BDS, which uh, encourages people not to uh, take the reality of the oppressor or the colonizer as the single reality. So there's, there's something beautiful in parkour and makes sense to me that people in Palestine are engaging with it. Mm. Because I think there is this liberating potential of shifting reality and making you see um, obstacles as not so much as obstacles anymore, but potentially you know, mm. uh, opportunities. Um, but um, the, uh, my question is much more about how parkour as a kind of really a Western cultural form, uh, at least in its origins, um, 
its connection with other street kind of art uh, forms or culture, for example, like hip hop, which has also um, had a kind of resurgence or, or you know, or kind of renaissance in, in Gaza specifically. Um, and given that Gaza has this kind of uh, strange conservative Islamic history within within you know the Palestinian territories, mm. uh, you know, and, and a kind of inheritance from the Islamic Brotherhood and a particular form of Islamic kind of fundamentalism from from Egypt. So it's it's kind of interesting to me in terms of that movement as well is that there's these kind of popular art forms that mm. you know have their the origins in the West that, uh, you know, that people in Gaza are kind of taking up and celebrating as a way of kind of moving, move a, a different type of movement intellectually away from a kind of conservatism as well. Mm. And that's sort of a kind of interesting thing that's happening there as well. Mm. So, so I guess, you know, that, it's horrible, isn't it, when you, and you catch yourself being one of those people that are commentating and not really articulating a question? But it was... It was I can I just, speak to it, though. I can speak to it because these, these young guys did, did connect or see themselves... Um, sim they saw similarities with the plights of the young breakdancers and the hip-hoppers who were using their physical, artistic, creative practice in one location to connect with a transnational community, to get a message out, to say something internationally about, about their lives in, in Gaza. Um, and they, their communities in terms of doing parkour, they said they had to go and do it in cemeteries and do it away because they, people didn't like seeing them do it. You know, they, they found it quite threatening or they didn't understand it. They had, um, uh, uh, the Gazan police taking away, you know, actually locking them away for, for days, taking away their technologies, telling them they can't do it. And so they're kind of anti-authority within, um, within that local structure, but in a way of, um, yeah, I think they, 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 they aligned with the efforts and strategies of, like you say, those, that, the, the growing movement of young people, different types of, um, of politics. In, pra in, in place, but also connecting internationally via, via phones, via ways to, to share. And these guys are, you know, very rudimentary technologies on old computers that they get limited electricity. And as soon as they've filmed themselves, they're there and they're editing and they're adding music and they're working together and then they're trying to upload it and seeing a transnational community comment on it. And then out they go the next day to try and film themselves again. And so it's a local type of politics, but and with a transnational community. So it's quite an interesting um, ideas around space and place and, and politics um, here. But I think the theme connecting, if I can connect back to the Afghanistan project, which really kind of stopped me in my tracks when I realized this was going on, is, is how some of these young people see these sports as not just helping them overcome the struggles of everyday life, but actually as a way out. And when my work with the, an NGO, that's very problematic for them where they're trying to build leaders within Afghanistan who will create change there. But these young people come to this organization because there's international staff there and they've seen others get out. So for an organization, for an NGO, um, so I don't know their true motives of coming to these sports. Are they seeing them purely as a way to help them get out? Um, what's, and I think that's kind of thrown me a little bit within the broader Marsden where I was looking at forms of agency within a local context. But when there are some participants who are coming to these sports primarily to help them, help them to escape, and that comes with a whole lot of different ethical and, you know, uh, research issues to explore. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, I'd better unmute myself. Um, um, just, just to add on to that, it was just really interesting what, just what you said there about agency and whether people are looking at these um, sports NGOs as a way out. And you kind of think, well, gosh, can you blame them really? I mean, in a way, they're using their agency to do anything they can of course, yeah. in order to get out. Um, you know, of course, not everyone will want to do that. But I often, I was just thinking when you were talking about um, these two boys from Gaza. Uh, applying for visas, A, I was kind of surprised that they got visas in the first place because I would have thought, 
that you know it was obvious that they'd want to claim asylum as soon as they got out and again who could blame them mm. um but they actually once they got there their different experiences of being in sweden and was it italy was the other place mm -hmm. um because especially with the current politics in italy and the right-wing nationalist government they've got in um they're yeah. probably yeah I, I wonder how that guy is surviving i mean is he uh pretty much under the radar that's something I really explored in my more recent interviews is like, because now they're both in Sweden, um, and why, why Sweden? Why? Um, and what's their perceptions of that experience of, of imagined? Is Sweden a place that when they're in Gaza, go to Sweden? Because uh, for, for a time there, it was, um, you know, the prime minister was saying we need to have open hearts. There was quite a, a welcoming, and then that's shifted over the, over the past few years in quite a different discourse now. And um, so I was interested to see how they'd experience that from, from where to go and why, and then what's the realities of that. And um, one, of, one of my participants had applied for asylum and been rejected, basically, because he wouldn't say that he was, um, you know, if he went home, he'd be killed. Or he, he refused to play that game in terms of what he was supposed to say. Um, and he fa he's found the system within Sweden very challenging and frustrating. He mentioned that, um, one of them mentioned that they say, wait, wait, wait until things change. And he's like, when are things going to change? So there's, there's within particular countries that experience of, of migration and getting visas and, and different countries, of, we all know that, you know, over time, and this project's been over time, there have been, you know, shifts there as well. So no, it's a good point. And it's something when I was thinking about time, I just can't squeeze it all in. <laughs> Maybe we um, move to wrap things up then. Um, if there is someone else I can't see on the screen who's asking a question, please just raise your voice. But in the absence of that, we will wrap things up. Thank you very much again, Holly, oh, my pleasure. Um, for, for, for a wonderful presentation and for the um, great questions and obviously a really fascinating area of research. We look forward to seeing more coming Thank out you. along with. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for joining us and your great questions. I really appreciated them. And if you do something else pops up, email me. Um, I would be you know, welcome any suggestions or conversations. <laughs>